chapter eight of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen jewish fairy tales and legends by gertrude landa the beggar king proud king haggai sat on his throne in state and the high priest standing by his side read from the holy book as was his daily custom he read these words for riches are not for ever and doth the crown endure to every generation cease cried the king who wrote those words they are the words of the holy book answered the high priest give me the book commanded the king with trembling hands the high priest placed it before his majesty king haggai gazed earnestly at the words that had been read and he frowned raising his hand he tore the page from the book and threw it to the ground i haggai am king he said and all such passages that offend me shall be torn out he flung the volume angrily from him while the high priest and all his courtiers looked on in astonishment i have heard enough for to-day he said too long have i delayed my hunting expedition let the horses be got ready he descended from the throne stalked haughtily past the trembling figure of the high priest and went forth to the hunt soon he was riding furiously across an open plain toward a forest where a wild stag had been seen a trumpet sounded the signal that the deer had been driven from its hiding-place and the king urged his horse forward to be the first in the chase his majesty's steed was the swiftest in the land quickly it carried him out of sight of his nobles and attendants but the deer was surprisingly fleet and the king could not catch up with it coming to a river the animal plunged in and swam across scrambling up the opposite bank its antlers caught in the branch of a tree and the king arriving at the river gave a cry of joy now i have thee he said springing from his horse and divesting himself of his clothing he swam across with naught but a sword as he reached the opposite bank however the deer freed itself from the tree and plunged into a thicket the king with his sword in his hand followed quickly but no deer could he see instead he found lying on the ground beyond the thicket a beautiful youth clad in a deerskin he was panting as if after a long run the king stood still in surprise and the youth sprang to his feet i am the deer he said i am a genie and i have lured thee to this spot proud king to teach thee a lesson for thy words this morning before king haggai could recover from his surprise the youth ran back to the river and swam across quickly he dressed himself in the king's clothes and mounted the horse just as the other hunters came up they thought the genie was king haggai and they halted before him let us return said the genie the deer has crossed the river and has escaped king haggai from the thicket on the opposite side watched them right away and then flung himself on the ground and wept bitterly there he lay until a woodcutter found him what do you hear asked the man i am king haggai returned the monarch thou art a fool said the woodcutter thou art a lazy good for not to talk so come carry my bundle of sticks and i will give thee food and an old garment in vain the king protested the woodcutter only laughed the more and at last losing patience he beat him and drove him away tired and hungry and clad only in the rags which the woodcutter had given him king haggai reached the palace late at night i am king haggai he said to the guards but roughly they bade him be gone and after spending a wretched night in the streets of the city his majesty next morning was glad to accept some bread and milk offered to him by a poor old woman who took pity on him he stood at a street corner not knowing what to do little children teased him others took him for a beggar and offered him money later in the day he saw the genie ride through the streets on his horse all the people bowed down before him and cried long live the king woe is me cried haggai in his wretchedness i am punished for my sin in scoffing at the words of the holy book he saw that it would be useless for him to go to the palace again 
and he went into the fields and tried to earn his bread as a laborer he was not used to work however and but for the kindness of the very poorest he would have died of starvation he wandered miserably from place to place until he fell in with some blind beggars who had been deserted by their guide joyfully he accepted their offer to take the guide's place months rolled by and one morning the royal heralds went forth and announced that good king haggai would give a feast a week from that day to all the beggars in the land from far and near came beggars in hundreds to partake of the king's bounty and haggai stood among them with his blind companions in the courtyard of the palace waiting for his majesty to appear he knew the place well and he hung his head and wept his majesty will speak to each one of you who are his guests to-day cried a herald and one by one they passed into the palace and stood before the throne when it came to haggai's turn he trembled so much that he had to be supported by the guards the genie on the throne and haggai looked long at each other art thou too a beggar said the genie nay gracious majesty answered haggai with bent head i have sinned grievously and have been punished i am but the servant of a troop of blind beggars to whom i act as guide the genie king signed to his courtiers that he desired to be left alone with haggai then he said haggai i know thee i see that thou hast repented it is well now canst thou resume thy rightful place gracious majesty said haggai i have learned humility and wisdom the throne is not for me the blind beggars need me let me remain in their service it cannot be said the genie i see that thou art truly penitent thy lesson is learned and my task is done i will see that the blind beggars lack not with his own hands he placed the royal robes on haggai and himself donned those of the beggar when the courtiers returned they saw no difference king haggai sat on the throne again and nowhere in the whole world was there a monarch who ruled more wisely or showed more kindness and sympathy to all his subjects end of chapter eight chapter nine of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen jewish fairy tales and legends by gertrude landa the quarrel of the cat and dog in the childhood of the world when adam named all the animals and ruled over them the dog and the cat were the greatest good friends they were inseparable chums in their recreations faithful partners in their transactions and devoted comrades in all their adventures their pleasures and their sorrows they lived together shared each other's food and confided their secrets to none but themselves it seemed that no possible difference would ever arise to cause trouble between them then winter came it was a new experience to them to feel the cold wind cutting through their skins and making them shiver the dismal prospect of the leafless trees and the hard cold ground weighed heavily upon their hearts and worse still there was less food the scarcity grew serious and hunger plunged them into unhappiness and despair doggy became melancholy while pussy grew peevish then petulant and finally developed a horrid temper we can't go on like this moaned the cat i think we had better dissolve partnership we can't find enough to share when we are together but separately we ought each to discover sufficient forage in our hunting i think i can help you because i am stronger said the dog pussy did not contradict but she thought the dog a bit of a fool and too good-natured she knew herself to be sly and intended to rely on that quality for her future sustenance doggy was deeply hurt at pussy's desire to end their happy compact but he said quietly of course if you insist on parting i will agree it is agreed then purred pussy where will you go asked doggy to the house of adam promptly replied the cat who had evidently made up her mind there are mice there adam will be grateful if i clear them away 
i shall have food to eat very well assented the dog i will wander further afield then the cat said solemnly we must each take an oath never to cross the other's path that is the proper way to terminate a business agreement the serpent says so and he is the wisest of all animals they put their right forepaws together and gravely repeated an oath never to interfere with each other by going to the same place then they parted doggy trotted off sorrowfully with his head hanging down once he looked back but puss did not do so she scampered off as fast as she could to the house of adam father adam she cried i have come to be your slave you are troubled with mice in the house i can rid you of them and i want nothing else for my services thou art welcome said father adam stroking pussy's warm fur puss rubbed her head against his feet purred contentedly and ran off to look for mice she found plenty and soon grew fat and comfortable adam treated her kindly and she soon forgot all about her former comrade poor doggy did not fare so well indeed he had a rough time he wandered aimlessly about over the frozen ground and could not find the slightest scrap of food after three days weary paw sore and dispirited he came to a wolf's lair and begged for shelter the wolf took pity on him gave him some scraps of food and permitted him to sleep in the lair doggy was most thankful and sleeping with his ears on the alert he heard stealthy footsteps in the night he told the wolf drive the intruders away said his host in a surly tone doggy went out obediently to do so but the marauders were wild animals and they nearly killed him he was lucky to escape with his life after bathing his wounds at a pool in the early morning he wandered all day long but again could find nothing toward night when he could scarcely drag his famished and wounded body along he saw a monkey in a tree kind monkey he pleaded give me shelter for the night i am exhausted and starving go away go away go away chattered the monkey jumping and swinging swiftly from branch to branch moving his lips quickly and opening and shutting his eyes comically doggy hesitated and to frighten him away the monkey pulled coconuts from the tree and pelted him poor doggy crawled miserably away what shall i do he moaned hearing the bleating of some sheep he made his way to them and asked them to take compassion on him we will they replied if you will keep watch over us and tell us when the wolf comes doggy agreed willingly and after he had devoured some food he stretched himself to sleep like a faithful watchdog with one eye open in the middle of the night he heard the wolves approaching and anxious to serve the sheep who had treated him kindly he sprang to his feet and began to bark loudly this aroused the sheep who awoke and started to run in all directions some of them ran right into the pack of wolves and were killed and eaten poor doggy was nearly heartbroken it is my fault my fault he wailed i barked too soon oh what an unhappy creature i am i shall keep away from all animals now once again he set off on his travels whenever he met an animal he ran off in the opposite direction he had to make his journey by the loneliest paths and the most unfrequented routes and the difficulty of finding food grew steadily greater at last he grew so weak and thin that he hardly had strength to crawl and he had several narrow escapes from falling a prey to ferocious beasts one night he came to a house and begged a morsel of food it was given and during the night he woke the man and warned him that wild animals were making a raid the man jumped up seized his bow and arrow and drove the thieves away then he patted doggy good dog he said you are a wise animal stay with me always you will find father adam kind father adam cried doggy in alarm i must not stay here nonsense i say you must answered adam and doggy was compelled to obey in the morning pussy learned that the dog had joined the household and she complained to adam the dog has violated the oath he swore not to come to the place where i am she said he did not know you were here said adam desirous of maintaining peace he is very useful i want him to remain he won't hurt you there is ample room for both no there isn't said puss spitefully 
arching her back and getting cross he broke his oath he is a wicked creature you dare not overlook his offence poor doggy stood dejectedly apart with his tail between his legs i didn't know it was adam's house and i was so hungry and miserable and tired he said but pussy would not be pacified she thrust out her ugly claws and tried to scratch her former partner the dog kept out of her way as much as possible but she quarrelled with him at every opportunity and at last he determined to tolerate her conduct no longer i must leave you father adam he said pussy is making my life unbearable but i want you said adam i'm sorry said doggy firmly but it is really impossible for me to continue in your service i've got another situation at the house of seth he wants me too won't you make friends with pussy asked adam with pleasure if she will let me but she won't you blame each other said adam losing patience i can't make you out you look like quarrelling for ever adam's words have proved true ever since that time the cat and dog have failed to agree and pussy will never consent to be friendly again with doggy end of chapter nine chapter ten of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen jewish fairy tales and legends by gertrude landa the water babe floating in a basket on the river nile princess bathia the daughter of pharaoh king of egypt found a tiny little water babe princess bathia was a widow and had no children and she was so delighted that she took the child home to the palace and brought it up as her own she called the babe moses he was a pretty little boy full of fun and frolic as he grew up and he became a favorite with everybody in the palace even the cruel king pharaoh who had ordered that all the hebrew boy babes should be drowned loved to play with him his ministers of state and magicians however frowned when they saw moses as soon as he could toddle and talk making a playmate of the king they warned pharaoh that it was dangerous to give a strange child such privileges but princess bathia only laughed at them so did her mother the queen and king pharaoh took no notice when moses was three years old princess bathia gave a birthday party in his honor it was really a big banquet and was attended by the king and queen and all the courtiers moses was seated at the head of the table and his eyes opened very wide with wonderment at everything he saw it seemed such a ridiculous lot of solemn fuss to him he would rather have played on the floor or climbed on to the table but of course they would not allow him what does all this mean he asked of the king who was seated next to him tell me and he playfully pulled king pharaoh's beard the courtiers looked on horrified and bilam the chief magician cried out beware o king this is not play heed not these words my father said the princess bilam is ever warning thee if thou wert to take notice of all that he says thou wouldst not have a moment's peace take our little babe on thy knee and play with him to please the princess king pharaoh did so and moses amused himself by playing with the glittering jewels on his majesty's robes then he looked up and stared at the king's head what is that he asked pointing that is the royal crown answered pharaoh no it is not it is only a funny hat replied moses beware chimed in bilam solemnly let me put the hat on said moses reaching up his little hands and before they could stop him he had taken the crown from the king's head and had put it on his own princess bathy and the queen laughed merrily but bilam looked very grave your majesty he said in a voice trembling with passion this is not the foolish play of a babe this child remember is not as other children came he not from the river there is meaning in his action already does he seek to rob thee of thy royal crown tis a portent of evil pharaoh thoughtfully stroked his beard what saith rael he asked turning to his second chief magician i say the child is but a babe and that this action means nothing answered rael 
the queen and the princess agreed with riel who was their favourite but bilam would not allow the matter to pass lightly i bilam am chief of thy counsellors he said and deeply learned in the mysteries of signs and portents there is a meaning in all this remember o king this child is of the hebrews and escape thy decree this play of his hath a meaning should he be permitted to grow up he will rebel against thee and seek to destroy thy rule let him be judged o king thy words are wise said pharaoh who was himself annoyed with moses and he ordered three judges to try the child for his offence moses thought it was a new game and he clapped his hands gleefully when they took him to the court of justice and stood him in front of the judges he heard riel plead on his behalf but he did not understand it i say he is but a babe and does things without meaning riel exclaimed put him to the test and see if he knows the difference between fire and gold place before him a dish of fire and a dish of jewels and gold if he grasps the jewels it will prove that he is no ordinary child if he places his hand to the fire then shall we be assured he is merely a foolish babe so be it said bilam and if he grasps the jewels let his punishment be instant death pharaoh and the judges agreed and two dishes one containing burning coals and the other gold and precious stones were brought in and placed before moses everybody looked on keenly as moses stared at the dishes princess bathia made signs to him but bilam ordered her to cease and it was riel who comforted her and dried her tears take my magic staff he said handing to her a stick that seemed to be made of one large precious stone this was given to adam when he left the garden of eden and has been handed down to me through enoch and noah through abraham and jacob unto joseph who left it in my keeping take the staff and moses will obey whatsoever be thy wish the princess took the staff and pressed it to her lips i wish she said that my little water babe shall seize the burning coals moses thrust his fingers into the fire and pulled out a glowing coal with a cry he put his fingers in his mouth to ease the pain and burned his tongue with the coal ever afterward he lisped the princess snatched moses and pressed him tightly to her bosom give me the magic stick she said to riel so that i may guard and protect the child canst thou read this word asked riel pointing to a word engraved on the staff no said the princess then it cannot be thine answered riel whosoever reads this name can understand all things even the thoughts of animals and birds fear not for moses in years to come the staff shall be his and so it came to pass years afterward when moses was a man and fled from egypt he married a daughter of riel who became a hebrew and took the name of jethro riel planted the staff in his garden and moses saw it he read the magic word and touching the staff it came out of the ground into his hands with this staff moses performed the wonderful things in egypt when he delivered the children of israel from bondage as is related in the bible end of chapter ten chapter eleven of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org jewish fairy tales and legends by gertrude londa chapter eleven sinbad of the talmud rabba rabba silly silly rabba have you caught another whale to-day with this strange cry a number of children followed an elderly man through the streets of a town in the east their parents looked on in amusement and some of them called after the man as the little ones did rabba however took no notice but walked straight on with a faraway look in his eyes as if his thoughts were elsewhere presently on turning the corner of a street he nearly ran into an arab coming in the opposite direction 
as soon as the children saw the arab they turned and fled ali rabba's coming they cried to one another in warning and as fast as their legs would carry them they made off to their homes the arab shook his fist threateningly after the children then he turned to the man whom they had followed it is a shame he said hotly that the impudent ragamuffins of the town should be allowed to cast words of disrespect in the public streets at my sainted master rabba barchana the man of profound learning and the famous traveller be gentle good ali interrupted rabba remember they are little more than babes and have not full understanding and how can they be respectful when their parents who should have wisdom and faith accept not our stories of the many adventures we have had yesterday i told them of the day when our ship had been surrounded by five thousand whales each a mile long and they jeered and cried impossible impossible echoed ali in a rage was i not there with thee my master did i not count every single whale myself who dares to doubt my word have i not for years been thy faithful guide on thy marvellous journeys bah what know these town fools whose lives are no wider than the narrow streets in which they dwell of the wonders of the vast world beyond the seas fools ignorant fools every one of them my good master why stay you here with them and brook their insults and their sneers let us journey forth again this very day or good ship waits in the harbour ali's voice grew louder as his rage became stronger and a crowd was collecting rabba hurried him away and together they made for the harbour there they were soon engaged in earnest conversation with the captain of a vessel that had come from a distant land i shall be glad to have such two famous travellers on my ship said the captain i have heard of your adventures and in my country it is said that only those meet with wonders who dare to seek them and believe in them i too would see the wonders of the world and gladly will i give you passage on my ship next day rabba and ali stood on the deck of the vessel and the sail was hoisted and it moved slowly from the harbour to the accompaniment of cheering and some laughter from a crowd on the shore silly rabba and ali rabba don't forget to bring back the moon they cried find out where it goes when it's not here soon the land was out of sight and scudding before favourable breezes the ship made good progress in ten days it had reached a sea in which no vessel had ever sailed before ali said he could tell this because the fishes behaved queerly they poked their heads out of the water to gaze at the ship and then darted swiftly out of sight again it was quite plain that they had never before seen a ship and they evidently mistook it for some strange sea monster every day the fishes grew larger but no land was sighted until another five days had passed then a desert island appeared straight ahead and the captain steered toward it a few blades of grass grew here and there and rabba determined to land and explore the island accompanied by his faithful ali he entered a small boat and was rowed to the shore they found a few vegetables growing that they had never seen before and so collecting twigs from the short stumpy bushes they made a fire to cook them while the vegetables were cooking they looked around it seems a vast land said rabba and yet over there about three or four miles away i think i see water i think so too said ali this must be the width of the land but in the other directions i can see no end but ark what sound is that tis the rumbling of an earthquake said rabba and i am sure i felt the ground move indeed it seems to me as if it is heaving up and down like a living thing a shout from the boat caused them to look in that direction and they saw their comrades pointing wildly and calling upon them to come back looking in the direction indicated they saw the land rise up like a huge mountain and a tremendous stream of water gush forth 
this is not land this is a whale cried rabba in alarm our fire has wakened it from slumber let us hasten to the ship before the monster plunges and drowns us they hurried back to the boat and boarded the ship just as the whale began to move it sank below the waves to quench the fire on its back but it rose again and then the vessel found itself in a new danger it was lying between the body of the monster and one of its fins let me take command said ali i know best how to act in times of danger like this we must avoid being struck by the fin or we shall be destroyed we must find which way the monster is moving and go in the opposite direction otherwise we shall be wrecked when we come to this place where the fin joins the body there was no sleep for the crew that night every one watched carefully for the least false move may have meant instant disaster luckily the whale began to move on the surface of the sea against the wind so that the ship travelling in the opposite direction had the wind behind it swiftly flew the ship before the breeze but the fin seemed to have no end although the whale was travelling fast too three days and three nights the ship continued before it came to the end of the fin then every one on board breathed more freely that was a lucky escape said the captain to rabba speak not too soon replied the latter i have fears yet we must hasten to get completely away from this monster but the wind does not favor any alteration of our course even as he spoke there was a great commotion in the water and the whale began to move backward at so fearful a speed that they could scarcely see it the water was violently agitated and the ship was tossed about as if it were a mere cork a whole day this lasted then the motion grew slower as the head of the whale came past the ship see cried ali excitedly a small fish is stuck in the nostril of the monster that is the cause of this commotion the monster will surely be killed the agitation of the water now died down and it was seen that the whale was beginning to turn over the monster is dead said rabba it will float on the waves like a vast desert land and will be a danger to ships for several days the vessel was compelled to follow the dead whale whenever an attempt was made to move away the current or the wind changed and the carcass of the monster followed the ship the captain did not like this at all for it was dangerous in the extreme he was afraid that the dead whale would strike the vessel and wreck it at last land was sighted not even rabba and ali could recognize the country they said they had never seen it before beautiful cities dotted the shore but to everybody's alarm the body of the whale began to float toward the land to make matters worse a storm arose and the monster rose and fell with each motion of the angry waves the cities will be destroyed if the whale strikes them cried rabba and it is impossible for us to warn the people nearer and nearer the whale was driven while the captain of the ship did his utmost to keep away so as not to be struck by the backwash at length with a tremendous crash the monster was flung by the waves which had increased to a great height against the shore above the shrieking of the wind could be heard the noise of falling buildings and the wild cries of the people a huge wave caught the ship and carried it a mile out to sea and then whirled it back again at a speed that made the crew hold their breath in awe it seemed certain that the vessel would be dashed to pieces on the land and the crew with cries of warning and alarm made haste to lash themselves to the masts the mighty wave swept over the land over the ruins of the towns carrying the ship with it and finally deposited it among the trees of a dense forest a mile from the shore at least we are safe for the present 
said Rabba, when he had recovered from the shock and the surprise. We are more fortunate than the poor people who have been overwhelmed by this strange disaster. I should like to know how I'm going to get my ship back to the sea, said the captain. I never heard of such a predicament before. Rabba merely shrugged his shoulders, and with Ali he walked to the shore. An extraordinary sight met their gaze. Thousands of people were rushing madly to the forests. Everywhere was ruin and desolation, all the towns along the coast, sixty in number, they learned afterward, had been destroyed by the stranding of the monster and the tidal wave that followed, and what had not been leveled and swept out to sea had been carried inland to the forests and beyond. All along the coast, as far as the eye could see, lay the body of the whale like a mountain range and hundreds of people ran up and down, weeping bitterly and wringing their hands. Rabba gathered as many of them as he could together and addressed them. Good people, he said, ye are the victims of a terrible calamity that has robbed you at one cruel blow of your homes, and many of you of your families. But ye that have survived have duties to yourselves and to the future in this hour of grief despair not there lies the fearful monster that has been your destruction it shall also be your salvation its body can supply you all with food what you cannot eat you can salt and store for the future Thousands of casks of oil can be obtained from its blubber, and with this ye can trade. Then, too, its bones are valuable. The people thanked Rabba for his good advice, and immediately they set about doing what he bade them. They told him this was a bewitched land, the country of Kishef, abounding with terrible monsters both on land and in the sea, and ruled over by a malignant jinn named Hormuz, who gave them no peace. They asked Rabba to try and kill this sprite, who said that only a stranger to the land can do him harm. And so Rabba and his faithful Ali, mounted on horses, set forth on their adventures. I think I know this country, said Ali. I believe I landed once on the other shore. We cannot be far from the wilderness in which the Israelites wandered. For several days they journeyed through forests and across plains, and nothing happened. At last they came to a broad, high wall, which barred their progress. They could find no opening through which to pass and while they were wondering what to do, a strange figure suddenly appeared on the wall. One of his legs was longer than the other, and his arms were also of different length. His ears and eyes were also unequal, and he hopped and bounded along the wall at amazing speed. "'My name is Hormuz,' he cried. "'Who are ye?' "'Strangers,' called Rabba and as soon as he heard the word, the sprite darted swiftly off along the top of the wall, but although the horses ran at topmost speed, they could not overtake him, and he quickly disappeared. Where he was lost to sight, however, there was a hole in the wall, and through this Rabba and Ali just managed to take their horses. A vast wilderness lay before them, Ali picked up two clods of earth and smelled them. As I thought, he said, this is the wilderness of the Israelites. Come, I will show thee strange sights. Before nightfall they came to a place where the bodies of a large number of men lay strewn on the ground. These men must have been giants, said Rabba, as Ali, with his spear uplifted, rode under the raised knee of one of the bodies. These must be the bodies of the Ephraimites who left Egypt before the rest of the children of Israel and were slain. He cut off a portion of a garment 
that still covered one of the bodies, but when he tried to move he could not. He seemed to be rooted to the spot, nor could his horse move. Uh-oh, cried Ali, my horse has lost its power to move. Thou must have taken something from the dead. Return it, good master, we shall be held here fast until we perish. Rabba returned the piece of garment, and they were able to move again. They hurried from the place and came to a chasm in the ground from which smoke was rising. This is the pit in which Korah and his children were swallowed, said Ali. That must have been a wonderful sight, said Rabba. I have heard that the pit became like a funnel, and that the air all about it eddied and sucked in everything that belonged to Korah even the things that people had borrowed from him such as dishes rolled along the ground from a distance and into the pit come let us hasten away they continued their journey for many days but could not see the demon again one day the desert ended and they came to the sea they encamped for the night and when morning broke Rabba was surprised to find that the basket in which they kept their provisions had disappeared. "'I think I can explain,' said Ali. "'No thieves have been here, but this is the end of the world, the edge of the earth. Here once every twenty-four hours the sky and the earth in their revolution scrape together. The sky must have caught up your basket and carried it away.' It will be returned at the same hour tomorrow morning. Rabba awoke the next morning before the sunrise and saw his basket floating down to earth on a cloud. Both he and Ali were overjoyed when they recovered it, for they were very hungry. While they were eating, the sky grew dark, and looking up they saw what appeared to be a great cloud above their heads. Out of the sea a mighty tree seemed suddenly to have grown. They moved cautiously forward to investigate. "'Take heed!' cried a voice of thunder. "'I am a bird standing in the water. It is so deep, with such swift currents, that seven years ago an axe fell in and has not yet reached the bottom.' Rabba and Ali crouched on the ground in great fear, until at last Rabba called, Mighty bird, we seek your help. We are anxious to find the wicked Jinn Hormuz and slay him so that people shall be free. Follow me, answered the bird, and like a spreading cloud it flew along the coast. Rabba and Ali followed on their horses. Look, cried Ali, suddenly pointing out to the sea. A huge snake and dragon were fighting, and at last the sea serpent, which was almost as big as the whale that had destroyed the towns, swallowed the dragon. No sooner had it done so, however, than the giant bird swooped down and gobbled up the snake. That was a good fat worm for breakfast called the bird. Now I shall rest. It flew toward a gigantic tree which now appeared. So tall was it that its upper branches were lost in the clouds. The bird perched on a branch of the tree. Proceed along the coast until you come to two bridges, said the bird. There you will find Hormuz. Give him two cups of wine to drink. Then you can slay him, but be sure you take the diamond from his cap. I, Aziz, give you this warning. Rabba thanked the bird for its information, and with Ali continued on his journey. After three days they came to a river, crossed by two bridges, and with one foot on each stood Hormuz. As soon as he saw them, he began to run. But Rabba called after him, We bring thee an offering of good wine. And he promptly returned. Rabba filled the two cups, which he had from a leathern bottle, and Hormuz took a cup in each hand, smacking his lips as he did so. 
See, he said, as he tossed the wine into the air, and the wine from the right-hand cup fell into the left-hand cup, and that from the left-hand cup into the right-hand cup, and not a drop was spilt. Then he swallowed them both at one gulp. Almost immediately he fell down into a stupor, and Rabba stabbed him again and again with his spear. Yet, when he seemed quite dead, he jumped up again. "'The diamond!' cried Rabba excitedly, and Ali snatched it from the cap of Hormuz. Then the demon fell dead. "'We can return now,' said Rabba, and they set out at once, taking the body with them. They halted only to take food, and the first time they did so a funny thing happened. Ali had killed an animal, and Rabba had caught some fish, and while these were cooking, Rabba took the jinn's diamond from his pocket and examined it. At once the fish and the animal came to life again, jumped out of the cooking pot, and made off. "'This is a magic diamond,' said Rabba, "'that has the power to bring dead things to life. We keep it covered when we wish to eat.' They did so, and after long journeying they came in sight of the great wall, and at last reached the place from which they had started. They had been away twelve months in all, and the people were heartily glad to see them, especially when they heard that Hormuz had been killed and saw his body. They had worked hard on the carcass of the huge whale, and were rebuilding the sixty towns and villages that had been destroyed with the bones of the monster, using the skin as coverings for their tents. With the help of the magic diamond, Rabba called the Ziz, and it took the ship which had been carried into the forest in its beak and flew with it to the sea, gathering their old comrades, Rabba and Ali, set sail for home. All the inhabitants stood on shore, and cheered as long as the ship was in sight. They were sorry that Rabba was gone, but they felt certain, now that Hormuz was dead, that never more would they be troubled by monsters which brought them such terrible disasters. End of section 11《Chapter Twelve of Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farnoosh Jahangiri. Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa. Chapter Twelve: The Outcast Prince. There lived a king who had an only son on whom he doted. No one, not even his oldest tutor, was permitted to utter a word of correction to the prince whenever he did anything wrong, and so he grew up completely spoiled. He had many faults, but the worst features of his character were that he was proud, arrogant, and cruel. Naturally, too, he was selfish and disobedient. When he was called to his lessons, he refused, saying, I am a prince. Before many years I shall be your king. I have no need to learn what common people must know. Enough for me that I shall occupy the throne and shall rule. My will alone shall prevail. Says not the law of the land, the king can do no wrong. Handsome and haughty, even as a youth, he made the king's subjects fear him by his imperious manner. His appearance in the streets was the signal for everyone to run into his house, bar the doors, and peer nervously through the casements. He was a reckless rider, and woe betide the unfortunate persons who happened to be in his way. Sparing neither man, woman, nor child, he callously rode over them, or lashed out vindictively with the long whip he always carried, laughing when anyone screamed with pain. So outrageous did his public conduct become that the people determined to suffer in silence no longer. They denounced the prince in public, they petitioned the king himself to restrain his son, and his majesty could not disregard the complaints. At first he was merely annoyed, and he was indignant, but when he saw that the people were thoroughly aroused and threatened revolt, he deemed it wise to inquire into the charges against his son. 
A commission of three judges was appointed to investigate. They made fullest inquiry and finally laid a document before the king summarizing what they did not hesitate to declare the infamous actions of his royal highness, the crown prince. The king's sense of justice and righteousness at once overcame his foolish pride. My people stand justified in their attitude, which at first I thought only disrespectful to my royal person, he said. I owe them an apology and recompense. I shall atone, and my son shall atone too. He shall not escape punishment. He summoned his son to appear before him, and the prince entered the royal justice chamber with the air of a braggart, smiling contemptuously at the learned judges who were seated to right and left of his majesty and defiantly cracking his whip. Knowest thou why thou hast been bidden to stand before the judges of the land? asked the king. I know not and I care not, was the haughty answer. The foolish chatter of the mob interests me not. The king frowned. He had not seen the prince behave in this fashion before. In the presence of his father, he had always been respectful. Thou hast disgraced thy honored name and thy mother's sacred memory, foolish prince, exclaimed the monarch angrily. Thou hast humiliated thyself and me before the people. Still the prince tried to laugh off the matter as a joke, and he quickly discovered that the king was in no mood for trifling. Standing grave and erect, his majesty pronounced sentence in a loud and firm voice. No, old man, he said while all the judges, counselors, officers of state, and representatives of the people stood awed to silence. That it having been proved an indisputable evidence that the prince, my son, hath grievously transgressed against the righteous laws of this land, and against the people, my subjects, on whom he hath heaped insults, I have taken counsel with my advisers, the ministers of state, and it is my royal will and pleasure to pronounce sentence. Wherefore I declare that my son, the prince, shall be cast forth into the world penniless, and shall not return until he shall have learnt how to count five. And be it further known that none may minister unto his wants, should he crave assistance by declaring he is my son, the prince. The prince stood astounded. What did the mysterious sentence mean? None could tell him. The only answer to his inquiries was a shrug of the shoulders, for nobody would speak to him. In the dead of night, with only the stars gazing down on the strange scene, the prince, clad in the cast-off garments of a common laborer, with his golden curls cut off and not a solitary cone in his pocket, was conducted outside the palace grounds and left alone in the road. He was too much dazed to weep. He told himself this was some horrible dream from which he would waken in the morning, to find himself in his own beautiful room, lying on his gilded bed under the richly embroidered silken coverlet. When dawn broke, however, he found himself hungry, tired, and his body painfully stiff under a hedge. He knew now it was no dream but a reality. He was alone and friendless, with no means of earning his food. He understood then what hardships the poor were compelled to undergo, and he began to realize how he had made them suffer, and how, in turn, he was now to pay a heavy price for his brutal treatment of the people. All that day he wandered aimlessly until, footsore and exhausted, he sank down at the door of a wayside cottage and begged for food and shelter. These were given to him, and next day he was set to work in the fields, but his hands were not used to labor, and he was sent adrift, his fellow workers jeering at him with a heavy heart, and his pride humbled, he set forth again to learn the mystery of how to count five. Long days and endless nights, through the heat of the summer, through the snows of winter, the autumnal rains and cold blasts of early spring, he wandered. The whole year passed away, and he had learned nothing. In truth, he had almost forgotten why he was aimlessly drifting from place to place farther and farther from his home. Hunger and thirst were more often than not his daily portion, and the cold earth by night was frequently his couch. 
Time seemed to drag along without meaning, and ofttimes for a week he heard not the sound of a human voice. He was a beggar, generally accepting gratefully what was given to him, sometimes with harsh words, often with kindly expressions. When he could, he walked doing anything for small coins, for a rabbi who had taken compassion on him, had said, Do any honest work, however repugnant it may at first seem, rather than say heartily, I'm the son of a rich father. For a moment he wondered whether the rabbi had guessed his secret, but the learned man said to him he was but repeating a maxim from the Talmud. Exactly a year from the date of his sentence, as well as he could keep count, the prince found himself in a strange land on the outskirts of a great city. There he fell in with a beggar who hailed him as a brother. Come with me, said the beggar. I know the lord of our fraternity, as few do. I know where to obtain the best food and shelter for not. Here in the city, a beautiful and noble princess has established a place where all wayfarers may rest and refresh. None are turned away. I will take you thither. The beggar was as good as his word, and the prince enjoyed the best meal and the most comfortable shelter since he had been an outcast. Overcome with emotion at the thoughts which were conjured up, he retired into a corner and wept. Suddenly he heard a voice of entrancing sweetness say, Why do you weep? He looked up and beheld the most beautiful woman his eyes had ever seen. Instinctively he rose and bowed low, but made no answer. The princess speaks. It is your duty to answer, said another voice, that of an attendant. A princess, of course, none but a princess could be so fair, and what a sympathetic voice she possessed. As a prince, he remembered he had spoken harshly as a rule, and had never visited any of the charitable institutions. You must have a history, said the princess kindly. Tell it to me. If it is to be kept a secret, you may place confidence in me. I shall not betray you. The prince was on the point of telling her everything, but he hesitated and said, Alas, I am an unhappy wandering beggar, as you see, O oh, most gracious princess. But pity me not, I am not worthy of your kind thoughts. A year ago I dwelt in a beautiful house. I was the only son of a rich merchant, and my father lavished all his love and wealth on me. But I was wicked, I was unkind to people, and I was cast forth in order not to return until I had learned to count five. I have not yet learned. I am doomed to a wretched life. That is the whole of my story. Strange, murmured the princess. I will help thee if I can. Next day she came again to the shelter, and with her was the rabbi who had given the prince good counsel. The rabbi made no sign that he had seen the stranger before. This sage of the Jews is a wise man and will teach thee said the princess, and at her bidding, the prince repeated what he had said the previous night. It is a simple lesson, said the rabbi. So absurdly simple. Unfortunately, that proud people overlook it. Tell me, my son, he added, hast thou experienced hunger? That I have, returned the prince sadly. Then canst thou count one? Dost thou know what it is to feel cold? I do. Who canst thou count? Tell me, further, dost thou know what kindness of heart is? That I have received from the poorest and also from the gracious princess. Thou hast proceeded far in thy lesson, said the rabbi. Thou canst now count three. Hast thou ever felt gratitude? Indeed I have often during this past year, and now most particularly. Four is now the toll of thy count, said the rabbi. Tell me, my son. Hast thou learned the greatest lesson of all? Dost thou feel humble in the spirit? With tears in his eyes, the prince answered, I do, most sincerely. Then hast thou truly learned to count five. Return to thy father. He must be a wise and just man to impose on thee this lesson. He will assuredly forgive thee. Go with my blessing. And the rabbi raised his hands above the young man's head and uttered a benediction. Take also my good wishes, said the princess, and she offered him her hand to kiss. Gracious princess, he said, 
it is not meet that a beggar in wax should speak what is in his heart but i shall return and if thou deemst me worthy perchance thou wilt grant the request that i shall make perchance replied the princess with a laugh the prince made haste to return to his father's palace and related all his adventures the old man listened quietly then he clasped his son in his arms forgave him and proudly proclaimed him prince before all the people again he was a changed man and never more guilty of a cruel action before many months had passed he returned to the city where he had seen the princess with a long retinue of attendants all bearing presents gracious princess he said when he had been granted an audience i said i would return indeed i know thee not the prince told her of their former meeting and she seemed highly pleased now he said put the crown on thy work which restored to me the manhood i had foolishly cast away by my conduct i would make thee my bride and with thee ever my guide and counsellor i shall be the most faithful of kings and thou a queen of goodness and beauty and wisdom such as the world has not yet seen the princess did not give her answer immediately but in due course she did and once again the prince returned home this time happier than ever Sitting by his side in the chariot of state was the princess radiant in smiles, for the people welcomed her heartily, strewing flowers in their paths, and ever afterward there was happiness throughout the land. End of chapter 12. Recording by Fano Jahangir. Chapter 13 of Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tally Haas. Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa. Chapter 13. The Story of Bostanaya. In the days of long ago, when Persia was a famous and beautiful land, with innumerable rose gardens that perfumed the whole country and gorgeous palaces, there lived a king named Hormuz. He was a cruel monarch, this Shah of Persia. He tyrannized over his people and never allowed them to live in peace. Above all, he hated the Jews. The descendants of Abraham, he said to his grand vizier, never know when they are beaten. How many times it has been reported to me that they have been wiped out of existence or driven from the land, I know not. Yet nothing, it seems, can crush their spirits. Tell me, why is this? It is because they have a firm faith in their future, answered the vizier. What mean you by those words? demanded the king angrily. I speak of only what I have heard from their wise men, the vizier replied hastily. They hold the belief that they will be restored as a united people to their own land. Under their own king? interrupted Hormuz. Under a descendant of the royal house of David, the vizier answered solemnly. The king stamped his foot with rage. How dare they think of another shah but me, he exclaimed, for his one idea of ruling over people was that he had every right to be cruel to them. Then he said suddenly, think you that if there were no more people who could trace their ancestry to this, this David, their faith would be shattered? Peradventure it may be so it shall be so cried the king there shall be no remnant of this house of david he summoned his executioners and when they were lined up before him he surveyed the evil-looking band with a cunning gleam in his eye unto you he said in a rasping voice i hand over all the descendants of the house of david to be found among the jews in the whole of the realm of persia slay them instantly see to it that not a single one man woman or child is left alive woe betide you and my counsellors this with a gleaming glance at the grand vizier if my commands are not carried out to the letter to your duties you are dismissed from the presence waving them away he indulged his fancy in thoughts of the coming executions chuckling the while from day to day he received the reports that his commands were being carried out the land was filled with weeping for the cruel butchery was worse than war none could defend themselves mere suspicion was enough for the executioners they wasted no time with doubts but slew all who were said to belong to the house of david 
the shah looked over the list each night and chuckled at last he was informed that all had been slaughtered tis well tis well he said rubbing his hands gleefully i shall sleep in peace to-night he slept in a bower in a rose garden and nowhere in the whole world are the roses so magnificent and so sweet scented as in persia i shall have pleasant dreams he muttered but instead he had a nightmare that frightened him terribly he dreamed that he was walking in his rose garden but instead of deriving pleasure from the beautiful trees he was only angered are there no white or yellow or pink roses he asked but received no answer all red deep deep red he muttered in his troubled manner tell me he demanded fiercely stopping before a tree heavily laden with flowers why are you so red today and the rose spoke and replied because of the innocent blood that has been shed it is royal blood that has drenched the ground and none but crimson roses shall bloom this year in persia bah screamed the enraged shah and drawing his scimitar he began hacking right and left among the flowers the beautiful blooms fell to the ground in great showers until the garden was so littered with red petals that it seemed flooded with a pool of blood at last only one tree remained and as the shah raised his sword to cut it down an old man stepped from behind it and confronted the king who art thou and whence comest thou the monarch asked fiercely no answer did the old man give gazing sternly into the eyes of the shah he raised his hand suddenly and unexpectedly and struck the king such a violent blow that he fell sprawling to the ground he lay half stunned among the red petals looking up at the old man art thou not satisfied with the destruction thou hast wrought the old man asked must thou take the life of the last rose tree the old man stooped to pick up the scimitar which had fallen from the king's grasp no no screamed hormuz fearing that he was to be slain he scrambled to his knees and with clasped hands pleaded to the old man take not my life he begged spare me and i shall spare the last tree and cherish it tenderly so be it said the old man holding the sword above his head it dropped to the ground and looking up hormuz saw that the stranger had vanished the shah awoke his body trembled with fear his head was wretched with a burning pain he looked round shuddering to see if the angry old man still stood above him with the threatening sword then he sent for his wizards expound to me my horrid dream he said their interpretations however did not please him ye are fools he cried make search and find me a man of wisdom who understands these mysteries seek a sage among the jews the royal servants hastened to do the king's bidding full well full well they knew that when hormuz was in a rage lives were quickly forfeit they seized the aged rabbi of the city and brought him before the shah canst thou interpret dreams asked the king abruptly dispensing with the usual ceremonies i can explain the meaning of certain things returned the rabbi then fail not to unravel the mystery of my dream said hormuz and he related it the secret i must know he concluded or but he stopped he was afraid to add the usual threat of death that morning tis a simple dream said the rabbi slowly the things of which men and even kings are but men dream in their sleep are connected with the deeds performed by day thy garden represents the house of david which thou hast sought to destroy the old man was king david himself and thou hast promised to cherish and nurture his one remaining descendant the shah listened in silence then with a flash in his eyes he said but all the descendants of this king david were slain all but one said the rabbi there is a boy babe born on the day the executions ceased where is he asked hormuz your vow the rabbi began nervously for he did not wish to hand over this child to death my promise shall be faithfully carried out interrupted the monarch the boy is in my house said the rabbi his mother who escaped the massacre died when he was born bring him hither commanded hormuz fear not from his finger he drew a ring and handed it to the learned man this is my bond he said the possession of this ensures thy safety the child was brought to the palace and the shah looked at him with intent gaze he shall be brought up as a prince said the king 
servants attendants and slaves shall he have in great number to minister unto all his needs he shall be treated with the utmost kindness and because of my dream in the garden i name him bostani the shah did this because bostan is the persian word for rose garden he touched the child with his jeweled scepter and all present bowed low before the babe and showed him the respect and devotion due to a prince hormuz however was too cruel to be quite satisfied he feared to harm the boy but he wanted some proof that bostanai was really a descendant of king david the child grew up into a handsome clever youth and hormuz partly out of fear but partly because he had really grown to love the boy kept him constantly by his side one day while sitting in the bower in the garden he watched the boy among the roses the day was hot and drowsiness came over the king he had not slept in that bower since the night of his fateful dream and he was not happy about doing so now but he did not lack courage and he called the boy to him bastanai he said stand guard by the door and move not while i sleep hormuz slept soundly and peacefully for some time and when he awoke he saw the lad standing motionless where he had placed himself bastanai he called and when the boy turned he was startled to see blood trickling from a wound on his face what is that he asked anxiously the sting of a wasp boston i replied is it not painful for answer the boy only smiled how did it happen asked the king the wasp stung me while i stood guard but couldst thou not brush it away no replied the boy proudly king david was my ancestor and in the presence of a king i must stand motionless until bidden to make any movement then before the king could catch him he swooned from loss of blood and fell to the ground he soon recovered however and the shah's doubts were set at rest i know now thou art truly of the house of david he said for none other could have shown such fortitude bastanai became the shah's favorite and when he grew up he was made the ruler of a province he lived happily and through him the Jews of the land also lived in prosperity and peace. End of chapter 13. Recording by Tally Haas. Chapter 14 of Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa Chapter 14 From Shepherd Boy to King On a desolate plain, a little shepherd boy stood alone. His day's work was over, and he had wandered through field and forest, listening to the twittering of the birds and the soft sound of the summer breezes as they gently swayed the branches of the trees. He seemed to understand what the birds were saying, and the murmuring of the brook that wound its way through the forest was like a message of nature to him. Sweet sounds were always in his ears. His heart was ever singing, for the shepherd boy was a poet. At times he would turn around sharply, thinking he had heard someone calling. One day he was quite startled. David, David, he thought he heard a voice calling, Thou shalt be king of Israel. But he could see nothing except the trees and the flowers, and so he left the forest and stood in the desolate plain. In the distance he saw a very high hill, and as he approached nearer he noticed on the summit a tall tree, without branches or leaves. With great difficulty he climbed the hill. It was quite smooth bare of vegetation and without rocks, and little David noticed that it gave forth none of those sweet sounds like music that came from other hills. The summit gained, he looked at the tree in wonderment. It was not of wood, but of horn. "'Tis strange,' said the boy. "'This must be a magic mountain. No tree or flower or shrub can grow in this barren earth. He tried to dig a clod of earth out of the ground, but could not do so, even with his knife. 
for the ground was as hard as if covered with tough hide. David was greatly puzzled, but being a boy of courage, he did not begin to run down the mountain. I wonder what will happen if I stay here, he said, and he seated himself at the foot of the mysterious horn that grew at the summit and looked about him. Then he noticed a most peculiar thing. The ground was rising and falling in places as if moved by some power beneath. Listening intently, he also heard a curious rumbling noise, and then a loud-sounding swish. At the same time, he saw something rising from the other end of the mountain and whirl through the air. "'That is just like a tail,' exclaimed David in surprise. The next minute he had to cling with all his might to the horn, for the whole mountain was moving. It was rising, and soon David was quite near the clouds. The earth was a great distance away, and, judging by a tremendous shadow cast by the sun, David could see that he was clinging to the horn of a gigantic animal. "'I know what it is now,' he said. "'This is not a mountain, but a unicorn. The monster must have been lying asleep when I mistook it for a hill.' David began to puzzle his brain as to a means of getting down from his perilous perch. "'I must wait,' he said, "'until the animal feeds. He will surely lower his head to the ground. Then I will slip off.' But a new terror awaited him. The roar of a lion was heard in the distance, and David found that he could understand it. "'Bow to me, for I am king of the beasts,' the lion roared. The lion, however, was so small compared with the unicorn that David could scarcely see it. The unicorn, as soon as it heard the command, began to lower its head, and soon David was enabled to slip to the ground. To his alarm, he found himself just in front of the lion. The king of the beasts stood before him with blazing eyes, lashing its sides with his tail. David lost not a moment. Drawing his knife from his belt, the brave boy advanced boldly toward the lion. Just then a sound attracted the attention of both the boy and the beast. It was a deer. "'I will save thee, boy,' it cried. "'Mount my back and trust to my speed.' Before the lion could recover from its surprise, David had sprung on to the back of the deer, which started to run at lightning speed. David clung tightly to its back. Behind him a fierce roar indicated that the lion was in pursuit. Across the desolate plain and through the forest the chase continued, and when David came within sight of human habitations again the deer stopped. "'Thou art safe now,' the deer said to him. "'Thou art to become king, and my command was to save thee. Fear not, I will lead the lion astray. David thanked the deer that had so gallantly saved his life, and as soon as he had slid from its back, it dashed off again, faster than ever, with the lion still in pursuit. Soon both were out of sight. David sang light-heartedly as he returned to his humble home, and years afterward, when he was king of Israel, and remembered his escape, he put the words of his song into one of his psalms. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Jewish Fairy Tales and Legends by Gertrude Landa Chapter 15 The Magic Palace Ibrahim, the most learned and pious man of the city, whom everybody held in esteem, fell on troubled days. To none did he speak of his sufferings, for he was proud, and would have been compelled to refuse the help which he knew would have been offered to him. His noble wife and five faithful sons suffered in silence. But Ibrahim was sorely troubled 
when he saw their clothes were wearing away to rags and their bodies wasting with hunger one day ibrahim was seated in front of the holy book but he saw not the words on its pages his eyes were dimmed with tears and his thoughts were far away he was daydreaming of a region where hunger and thirst and lack of clothes and shelter were unknown he sighed heavily and his wife heard my dear husband she said to him gently we are starving you must go forth to seek work for the sake of our five little sons yes yes he replied sadly and for you too my devoted wife but and he pointed to his tattered garments how can i go out in these who will employ a man so miserably clad i will ask our kind neighbors to lend you some raiment said his wife and although he made some demure at first she did so and was successful in obtaining the loan of a cloak which completely covered ibrahim and restored to him his dignified appearance his good wife cheered him with brave words he took his staff and set out with head erect and his heart filled with great hope all people saluted the learned ibrahim for it was not often he was seen abroad in the busy streets of the city he returned their greetings with kindly smiles but halted not his walk he had no wish to make any claims upon his fellow citizens who would no doubt have gladly assisted him he desired to go among strangers and work so that he should not be beholden to any one beyond the city gates where the palm trees grew and the camels trudged lazily toward the distant desert he was suddenly accosted by a stranger dressed as an arab o oh, learned and holy man of the city he said command me for i am thy slave at the same time he made a low bow before ibrahim my slave returned ibrahim in surprise you mock me stranger i am wretchedly poor i seek but the opportunity to sell myself even as a slave to any man who will provide food and clothing for my wife and children sell not thyself said the arab offer me for sale instead i am a marvellous builder behold these plans and models specimen of my skill and handiwork from beneath the folds of his ample robes the arab produced a scroll and a box and held them out to ibrahim the latter took them wonderingly on the scroll were traced designs of stately buildings within the box was an exquisite model of a palace a marvellous piece of work perfect in detail and workmanship ibrahim examined it with great care i have never seen anything so beautiful he admitted it is wrought and fashioned with exceeding good taste it is in itself a work of art you must indeed be a wondrous craftsman whence come you what matters that replied the arab i am thy slave is there not in this city some rich merchant or nobleman who needs the services of such talents as i possess seek him out and dispose of him to me to thee he will give ear to me he will not listen ibrahim pondered over this strange request for a while agreed he said at length together they returned to the city there ibrahim made inquiries in the bazaar where the wealthy traders met to discuss their affairs and soon learned of a rich dealer in precious stones a man of a multitude of charitable deeds who was anxious to erect an imposing residence he called upon the jeweler noble sir he said i hear that it is thy intention to erect a palace the like of which the city has not yet seen an edifice that will be an everlasting joy to its possessor a delight 
to all who gaze upon it and which will bring renown to the city that is so said the merchant you have interpreted the desire of my heart as if you had read its secret i would fain dedicate to the uses of the ruler of the city a palace that will shed lustre on his name it is well returned ibrahim i have brought thee an architect and builder of genius examine his plans and designs if they please thee as assuredly they will purchase the man from me for he is my slave the jeweller could not understand the plans on the scroll but on the model in the box he feasted his eyes for several minutes in speechless amazement it is indeed remarkable he said at last i will give thee eighty thousand gold pieces for thy slave who must build for me just such a palace ibrahim immediately informed the arab who at once consented to perform the task and then the pious man hastened home to his wife and children with the good news and the money which made him rich for the rest of his days to the arab the jeweller said thou wilt regain thy liberty if thou wilt succeed in thy undertaking begin at once i will forthwith engage the workman i need no workman was the arab's singular reply take me to the land whereon i must build and to-morrow thy palace shall be complete to-morrow even as i say answered the arab the sun was setting in golden glory when they reached the ground and pointing to the sky the arab said to-morrow when the great orb of light rises above the distant hills its rays will strike the minarets and domes and towers of thy palace noble sir leave me now i must pray in perfect bewilderment the merchant left the stranger from a distance he watched the man devoutly praying he had made up his mind to watch all the night but when the moon rose deep sleep overcame him and he dreamed he dreamed that he saw myriads of men swarming about strange machines and scaffolding which grew higher and higher hiding a vast structure ibrahim dreamed too but in his vision one figure that of the arab stood out above all other things ibrahim scanned the features of the stranger closely he followed as it were the man's every movement he noticed how all the workmen and particularly the supervisors did the stranger great honor showing him the deference due to one of the highest position and with grave and dignified mien the arab responded kindly from the heavens a bright light shone upon the scene the radiance being softest wherever the arab stood in his dream it so appeared to ibrahim he rose from his bed went out into the night and approached the palace magically rising from the waste ground beyond the city nearer and nearer his footsteps took him until he stood beside the arab again one of the chief workmen approached and addressed the stranger by name then it was ibrahim understood and he awoke the sun was streaming in through the lattice of his bedroom he sprang from his bed and looked out upon a magnificent spectacle beyond the city the sun's rays were reflected by a dazzling array of gilded cupolas and glittering spires the towers of the palace of marble that he had seen builded in his dream instantly he went out and made haste to the palace to assure himself that his dream was really over ibrahim and the jeweller arrived before the gates at the same moment they stood speechless with amazement and admiration before the model of the arab grown to immense proportions almost at the same moment the gates ornamented with beaten gold opened from within and the arab stood before them ibrahim bent low his head the arab addressed the merchant 
"'Have I fulfilled my promise and earned my freedom?' he asked. "'Verily thou hast,' answered the merchant. "'Then farewell, and may blessings rest on thee and the good Ibrahim and all your works.' Thus spoke the Arab, raising his hands in benediction. Then he disappeared within the golden doors. The jeweler and Ibrahim followed quickly, but though they hastened through the halls and corridors of many colored marbles, in and out of rooms lighted by windows of clearest crystal, and up and down staircases of burnished metal, they could find no one. Emerging into the open again, they saw a huge crowd standing in wonderment before the gates. "'Tell me,' said the jeweler, "'who was the builder of this magic palace?' "'Elijah the prophet,' said Ibrahim, "'the benefactor of mankind, who revisits the earth to assist in their distress those deemed worthy. Blessed am I, and blessed art thou for thy good deeds, for we have been truly honored. To show his gratitude, the merchant gave a banquet in his palace to all the people in the city, and scattered gold and silver pieces among the crowds that thronged the streets. End of chapter 15chapter 16 of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org jewish fairy tales and legends by gertrude lunda chapter 16 the sleep of 100 years it was at the time of the destruction of the first temple the cruel war had laid Jerusalem desolate, and terrible was the suffering of the people. Rabbi Onias, mounted on a camel, was sorrowfully making his way toward the unhappy city. He had traveled many days, and was weary from lack of sleep and faint with hunger. Yet he would not touch the basket of dates he had with him, nor would he drink from the water in a leather bottle attached to the saddle. Perchance, he said, I shall meet someone who needs them more than I. But everywhere the land was deserted. One day, nearing the end of the journey, he saw a man planting a carob tree at the foot of a hill. The Chaldeans, said the man, have destroyed my beautiful vineyards and all my crops but I must sow and plant anew so that the land may live again. Onias passed sorrowfully on, and at the top of the hill he stopped. Before him lay Jerusalem, not the once beautiful city with its hundreds of domes and minarets that caught the first rays of the sun each morning, but a vast heap of ruins and charred buildings. Onias threw himself on the ground, and wept bitterly. No human being could he see, and the sun was setting over what looked like a city of the dead. Woe, woe, he cried. Zion, my beautiful Zion, is no more. Can it ever rise again? Not in a hundred years can its glory be renewed. The sun sank lower as he continued to gaze upon the ruined city and darkness gathered over the scene. Utterly exhausted, Onias, laying his head upon his camel on the ground, fell into a deep sleep. The silver moon shone serenely through the night, and paled with the dawn, and the sun cast its bright rays on the sleeping rabbi. Darkness spread its mantle of night once more, and again the sun rose, and still Onias slept. Days passed into weeks, the weeks merged into months, and the months rolled on until years went by, but Rabbi Onias did not awaken. 
seeds blown by the winds and brought by the birds dropped around him took root and grew into shrubs and soon a thick hedge surrounded him and screened him from all who passed a date that had fallen from his basket took root also and in time there rose a beautiful palm tree which cast a shade over the sleeping figure and thus a hundred years rolled by suddenly onias moved stretched himself and yawned he was awake again he looked around confused strange he muttered did i not fall asleep on a hill overlooking jerusalem last night how comes it now that i am hemmed in by a thicket and am lying in the shade of this noble date palm with great difficulty he rose to his feet oh how my bones do ache he cried i must have overslept myself and where is my camel puzzled he put his hand to his beard then he gave a cry of anguish what is this my beard is snow white and so long that it almost reaches to the ground he sank down again but the mound on which he sat was but a heap of rubbish and collapsed under his weight beneath it were bones hastily clearing away the rubbish he saw the skeleton of a camel this surely must be my camel he said can i have slept so long the saddle-bags have rotted too but what is this and he picked up the basket of dates and the water-bottle the dates and the water were quite fresh this must be some miracle he said this must be a sign for me to continue my journey but alas that jerusalem should be destroyed he looked around and was more puzzled than ever when he had fallen asleep the hill had been bare of vegetation now it was covered with carob trees i think i remember a man planting a carob tree yesterday he said but was it yesterday he turned in the other direction and gave a cry of astonishment the sun was shining on a noble city of glittering pinnacles and minarets and around it were smiling fields and vineyards jerusalem still lives he exclaimed of a truth i have been dreaming dreaming that it was destroyed praise be to god that it was but a dream with all speed he made his way across the plain to the city people looked at him strangely and pointed him out to one another and the children ran after him and called him names he did not understand but he took no notice near the outskirts of the city he paused canst thou tell me father he said to an old man which is the house of onias the rabbi tis thy wit or thy lack of it that makes thee call me father replied the man i must be but a child compared with thee others gathered around and stared hard at onias didst thou speak of rabbi onias asked one i know of one who says that was the name of his grandfather i will bring him he hastened away and soon returned with an aged man of about eighty who art thou onias asked onias is my name was the reply i am called so in honor of my sainted grandfather rabbi onias who disappeared mysteriously one hundred years ago after the destruction of the first temple a hundred years murmured onias can i have slept so long by thy appearance it would seem so replied the other onias the temple has been rebuilt since then then it was not a dream said the old man they led him gently indoors but everything was strange to him the customs the manners the habits of the people their dress their talk was all different and every time he spoke they laughed thou seemst like a creature from another world they said thou speakest only of the things that have long passed away 
one day he called his grandson lead me he said to the place of my long sleep perchance i will sleep again i am not of this world my child i am alone a stranger here i would fain leave ye taking the dates and the bottle of water which still remained fresh he made his way to where he had slept for a hundred years and there his prayer for peace was answered he slept again but not in this world will he awaken end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of jewish fairy tales and legends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org jewish fairy tales and legends by gertrude wanda chapter seventeen king for three days godfrey de bouillon was a famous warrior a daring general and bold leader of men who gained victories in several countries and so in the year ten ninety five when the first crusade came to be arranged he was entrusted with the command of one of the armies and led it across europe in the historic march to the holy land like many a great soldier of his period godfrey was a cruel man and above all he hated the jews in this our holy war he said to his men we shall slay all the children of israel wherever we shall fall in with them i shall not rest content until i have exterminated the jews true to his inhuman oath godfrey and his soldiers massacred large numbers of jews they did this without pity or mercy saying we are performing a sacred duty for we have the blessings of the priests on our enterprise godfrey felt sure he would be victorious but he also wanted to obtain the blessing of a rabbi it was a curious desire but in those days such things were not considered at all strange and so godfrey de bouillon sent for the learned rabbi solomon ben isaac better known by his world-famed name of rashi rashi one of the wisest sages of the jews came to godfrey and the two men stood facing each other thou hast heard of my undertaking to capture jerusalem said godfrey haughtily i demand thy blessing on my venture blessings are not in the gift of man they are bestowed by heaven on worthy objects answered rashi trifle not with words retorted the warrior or they may cost thee dear a holy man can invoke a blessing but rashi was not afraid he was becoming an old man then but he was as brave as the swaggering soldier and he faced godfrey unflinchingly i can make no claim on the god of israel on behalf of one who has sworn to destroy all the descendants of his chosen people he said so ho exclaimed godfrey you defy me but he stopped his angry words abruptly he had no wish to quarrel with any holy man for that might make him nervous and nervousness then was misunderstood as superstition besides the rabbi might curse him if you will not bless he said perhaps you will deign to raise the veil of the future for me you wise men of the jews are seers and can foretell events so they say a hundred thousand chariots filled with soldiers brave determined and strong are at my command tell me shall i succeed or fail thou wilt do both rashi replied what do you mean demanded godfrey angrily this jerusalem will fall to thee so it is ordained and thou wilt become its king ha ha so you deem it wisest to pronounce a blessing after all interrupted godfrey i am content i have not spoken all 
said the rabbi gravely three days wilt thou rule and no more godfrey turned pale shall i return he asked slowly not with thy multitude of chariots thy vast army will have dwindled to three horses and three men when thou reachest this city enough cried godfrey if you think to affright me with these ominous words you fail in your intent and hearken rabbi of the jews your words shall be remembered should they prove incorrect in the minutest detail if i am king of jerusalem for four days or return with four horsemen you shall pay the penalty of a false prophet and shall be consigned to the flames do you understand you shall be put to death i understand well returned rashi quite unmoved it is a sentence which you and your kind love to pronounce with or without the sanction of those whom you call your holy men it is not i who fear godfrey de bouillon i seek not to peer into the future to assure my own safety with these words they parted the rabbi returning to his prayers and to his studies which have enriched the learning of the jews while godfrey proceeded to lay a trail of innocent jewish blood along the banks of the rhine in his march to palestine history has set on record the events of the crusade godfrey after many battles laid siege to the holy city captured it and drove the jews into one of the synagogues and burned them alive eight days afterwards his soldiers raised him on their shields and proclaimed him king godfrey was delighted but two days later he thought the matter over carefully and decided that he could not live in jerusalem always so next day he called together his captains and said you have done me great honor but i must return to europe and it would be more befitting that i should be styled duke of jerusalem and guardian of the holy city than its sovereign that night however he suddenly remembered the prediction of rashi for three days i have been king of jerusalem he muttered the rabbi of the jews spoke truth he could not help wondering whether the rest of the prophecy would be fulfilled and he became moody he was joyful when he gained a victory but there came also disasters and he was plunged into despondency the reverses affected the buoyancy of his troops disease decimated their ranks and desertions further depleted their numbers slowly but surely his mighty army dwindled away to a mere handful of dissatisfied men and decrepit horses it was a ragged and wretched procession that he led back across europe and daily his retinue grew smaller men and horses dropped from sheer fatigue helpless by the wayside and were left there to die with the hungry vultures perched on trees patiently waiting for the last flicker of life to depart before they set to work to pick the bones of all flesh godfrey de bouillon had gained his victory but at what cost thousands of men and women and children had been murdered thousands of his soldiers had fallen in battle and now hundreds of others had dropped out of the ranks to end their last hours on the ghastly road that led from jerusalem back to western europe do you wonder that godfrey was unhappy and that he thought every moment of the words of rashi at length he reached the city of worms where rashi dwelt with him were four men mounted on horses it is well he said with as much cheerfulness as he could muster as he surveyed the remnants of his once proud army the rabbi has failed godfrey bade his men fall into line behind him and he proudly rode through the gate of the city as he did so he heard a cry of alarm he turned hastily and saw a huge stone falling from the city's gate it dropped on the soldier riding just behind him killing both man and horse you have spoken truth would that i had taken heed of your words he said to the rabbi i am a broken man 
you will assuredly achieve great fame in Israel. And so it has come to pass. Should you by chance ever visit the city of Brussels, the capital of Belgium, fail not to look upon the statue of Godfrey de Bouillon, with his sword proudly raised. It stands in the place royal, but a few minutes' walk from the synagogue. Should you ever be in the ancient city of Worms that stands on the Rhine, do as other visitors, Jews and Gentiles, enter the synagogue that was built many centuries ago, and you will see the room where Rashi studied, and the stone seat on which he sat. And not far from the synagogue, you will see the ancient gate of the city, named in honor of Rabbi Solomon ben Isaac, the Rashi Gate. Perhaps it is the very one under which Godfrey de Bouillon passed into the city with his three mounted companions, as the legend tells. End of chapter 17